Take Two Elements, Call Me in the Morning, Chapter 10. The periodic table is a tricky thing, and most elements are more complicated than the straightforward nastiness of the poisoner's corridor. An element that is toxic in one situation can become a life-saving drug in another, and the reputations of a few element-based medicines extend back a surprisingly long time. The Magic of Silver Roman officers supposedly enjoyed better health than their lowly soldiers because they ate from silver platters. Most pioneer families in early America invested in at least one good silver coin, which spent its ride across the wilderness hidden in a milk jug, not for safekeeping, but to keep the milk from spoiling. The noted gentleman astronomer Tycho Brahe, who lost his nose in a sword duel in 1564, was even said to have ordered a replacement made of silver. The metal was fashionable and, more important, prevented infections. Archaeologists later dug up Bry's body and found a green crust on the front of his skull, indicating that Bry had probably worn not a silver but a cheaper, lighter copper nose. Either way, copper or silver, the story makes sense. Modern science confirms that those elements have antiseptic powers. If certain microbes inch across something made of copper or silver, they absorb some of those metallic atoms. The, those atoms mess up their inner workings, and the microbes die after a few hours. The difference between silver and copper is that silver, if ingested, colors the skin blue, permanently. Thankfully, this condition, called argyria, isn't fatal and causes no internal damage. A man in the early 1900s even made a living as the blue man in a freak show after overdosing on silver nitrate. He had taken the silver nitrate as a cure for another illness. In more recent times, a Montana man named Stan Jones ran for the U.S. Senate in 2002 and 2006 despite being alarmingly blue. To his credit, Jones had a good sense of humor about his condition. When asked by a reporter what he told children and adults who pointed at him on the street, he said, I just tell them I'm practicing my Halloween costume. Jones also gladly explained how he came to be blue. In 1995, he became obsessed with what was known as the Y2K computer crash. Y2K stood for the year 2000. The Y2K crash was expected to cause worldwide chaos, as computers that previously thought the abbreviation 00 referred to the year 1900 would at midnight on December 31, 1999, suddenly think that the clock had been turned back 100 years. Some people predicted that planes would drop out of the sky and civilization would melt down as a digital world went nuts. Jones was especially concerned with the potential lack of antibiotics during the coming chaos. His immune system, he decided, had better get ready, so he began to brew up silver water in his backyard. Jones drank his silver water for four and a half years, right until Y2K fizzled out in January 2000. Even though his fears didn't come to pass, Jones never regretted drinking all that silver and said he'd do it again if he ever came down with a disease. Being alive is more important than turning purple, he said. Mirror Images The best modern medicines are generally not just the isolated elements you find on the periodic table, but complex compounds made from several different chemicals. Nevertheless, in the history of modern drugs, a few unexpected elements have played big roles. This history largely concerns lesser-known heroic science scientists, such as Gerhard Domek, but it starts with Louis Pasteur and a particular discovery he made about a property of molecules found in living things called handedness, which gets at the very essence of living matter. Odds are you're right-handed, but really you're not. You're left-handed. Every amino acid that makes up every protein in your body has a left-hand twist to it. In fact, virtually every protein in every life form that is, has ever existed is exclusively left-handed. In 1849, at the age of 26, Pasteur was asked by a winemaker to investigate tartaric acid, a harmless waste product of wine production. Grape seeds and yeast decompose into tartaric acid and collect as crystals at the bottom of wine kegs. The tartaric acid from yeast also has a curious property. Dissolve it in water and shine a vertical slit of light through the solution, and the beam will twist clockwise away from the vertical. It's like a rotating dial. However, human-made tartaric acid does nothing like that. 
A vertical beam passes through the solution without being rotated. Pasteur wanted to find out why. He determined that it had nothing to do with the chemistry of the two types of tartaric acid. They behaved exactly the same way in chemical reactions, and exactly the same elements were present in each. Only when he examined the crystals with a magnifying glass did Pasteur notice a difference. The tartaric acid crystals from yeast all twisted in one direction, like tiny, severed, left-handed fists. The human-made tartaric acid twisted both ways, a mixture of left- and right-handed fists. Intrigued, Pasteur began the unimaginably tedious job of separating with tweezers the salt-sized gr grains into a lefty pile and a righty pile. He then dissolved each pile in water and tested more beams of light. Just as he suspected, the yeast crystals rotated light clockwise, while the mirror image crystals rotated light counterclockwise and by exactly the same number of degrees. Basically, Pasteur had shown that there are two identical but mirror image types of tartaric acid. More important, Pasteur later expanded this idea to show that life favors molecules of only one-handedness. Chemi chemists call this left and right-handedness chirality. Pasteur later admitted he'd been a little lucky with this brilliant work. Tartaric acid, unlike most molecules, is easy to see as chiral. Even more luckily, the weather cooperated. When preparing the man-made tartaric acid, Pasteur had cooled it down on a windowsill. The acid separates the left and right-handed crystals only below 79 degrees Fahrenheit, and it had been warmer that season. Had it been warmer that season, he never would have discovered handedness. Still, Pasteur knew that luck explained just part of his success. As he himself declared, chance favors only the prepared mind. You may be able to guess from his last name another contribution he made. Pasteur also developed pasteurization, a process that heats milk to kill infectious diseases. And most famously at the time, he saved a young boy's life with his rabies vaccine. For the later deed, he became a national hero, and he used that fame to open an institute in his name outside Paris to further his revolutionary work on germs and disease. Not quite coincidentally, it was at the Pasteur Institute in the 1930s that scientists figured out how the first laboratory-made pharmaceuticals worked. The Birth of Antibiotics In early December 1935, Gerhard Domek's young daughter, Hildegard, tripped down the staircase of the family home in Wuppertal, Germany, while holding a sewing needle. The needle punctured her hand and snapped off inside her. A doctor extracted the needle, but days later, Hildegard was suffering from a high fever and a horrible infection up and down her arm. As her condition worsened, Domic himself suffered, because death was a frighteningly common outcome for such infections. Once the bacteria began multiplying, no known drug would stop their spread. Except there was one drug, or rather, one possible drug. It was really a red industrial dye that Domic had been quietly testing in his lab. On December 20th, 1932, he had injected a litter of mice with ten times the lethal dose of streptococcal bacteria. He had done the same with another litter. He'd also injected the second litter with that industrial dye, Prontosil, 90 minutes later. On Christmas Eve, Domic went back to his lab to peek. Every mouse in the second litter was alive. Every mouse in the first had died. Germans, at the time, believed a little oddly that dyes killed germs by turning the germs' vital organs the wrong color. No one knew how they really worked, and because of that ignorance, numerous European doctors had attacked German chemotherapy, dismissing it as inferior to surgery in treating infection. Even Domek didn't quite believe in his drug. The mouse experiment and the first clinical trials in humans had gone well, but with occasional serious side effects, not to mention that it caused people to flush bright red like lobsters. Although he was willing to risk the possible death of patients in clinical trials for the greater good, risking his daughter was another matter. In this dilemma, Domic found himself in the same situation that Pasteur had been in 50 years before in France, when a young mother had brought her son, so mangled by a rabid dog that he could barely walk, to Pasteur. Pasteur treated the boy with a rabies vaccine tested only on animals, and the boy lived. Pasteur wasn't a licensed doctor, and he gave the vaccine to the boy despite the threat of criminal prosecution if it failed.
If Domic failed, he would have killed his daughter. As Hildegard became worse and worse, he remembered the two cages of mice that Christmas Eve. When Hildegard's doctor announced that he would have to amputate her arm, Domic decided to act. Breaking pretty much every rule in the book, he sneaked some doses of the experimental chemical from his lab and began injecting his daughter with the blood-colored drug. At first, Hildegard worsened. Her fever alternately spiked and crashed over the next couple of weeks. But suddenly, exactly three years after her father's mouse experiment, Hildegard stabilized. She would live with both arms intact. Even though Domic was obviously thrilled, he did not mention his secret experiment on Hildegard to his colleagues, only the official mouse and human trials. But his colleagues didn't need to hear about Hildegard to know that Domic had found a blockbuster, the first genuine antibacterial drug. It's hard to overstate what a re revelation this drug was. In Domic's day, people didn't have much hope of surviving even common infections. With Prontosil, that all changed. Despite Prontosil's success, no one really knew how it worked. Prontosil could kill bacteria in humans and mice, but couldn't kill bacteria in a test tube. Scientists at the Pasteur Institute started investigating the structure of Prontosil in 1935 and noticed the chemical was split up into two different molecules in the body. It was actually just one of these two molecules, called sulfonamide, that killed bacteria. Even after the discovery at the Pasteur Institute, Domic was still awarded with was still rewarded with the 1939 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology just seven years after the Christmas mice experiment. But it wasn't all great. The drug Domic had used to save his daughter's life began became a dangerous fad. People demanded it for every sore throat and sniffle and soon saw it as some sort of cure-all. Their hopes became a horrible joke when quick buck salesmen in the United States took advantage of this ignorance by selling the drug sweetened with antifreeze. Hundreds died within weeks. Nevertheless, legitimate versions of this and other sulfurous chemicals have now saved millions of people's lives across the world, making Domic's drug one of the most important discoveries in medical history.